Google has pretty much taken over the world with their artificial intelligence technology. And their tensor processing unit, that's TPU to you and me, has gotten huge attention powering AI applications just about everywhere on the cloud. Chances are when a Google thing does something smart, it's TPU back there doing the heavy lifting. But not all AI can be done in the cloud. What if we need some AI right here in my little IoT thingy, <laughs> and it can't send stuff back up to the cloud? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a tiny little TPU that would fit right there on my device? Well, it can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Guess what? There is a tiny TPU, and it's called Google Coral, and it's designed exactly for designs like mine and yours. My guest today is James McCurkin from Google, and we're going to talk about Google TPU and all it can do for AI at the edge. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Google's Coral TPU. Hi, James. Thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure to be here today. Okay, so before we jump into all the training and inference stuff, Let's talk a little bit about why this AI topic is so important. The number of connected IoT devices in the world is exploding right now, isn't it? That's right. So we can expect to see billions of IoT devices, and smart devices are the biggest set in that category. And I've also heard some crazy estimates about the percentage of those connected devices that are actually taking advantage of AI technology. We expect smart IoT devices to become the dominant device in that sector. We expect as we figure out how to get AI to be smaller, cheaper, lighter, faster, more secure, better, safer, that the decision to put AI in device hopefully will become an easy choice for engineers to make. So we've got bazillions of connected devices out there in the world, and all of them are needing to do AI. And AI is a very computationally hard problem, right? So what are we doing about that? That problem is the main goal of my team. I work on the Coral team here at Google, and our goal is to develop a robust platform to develop on-device machine learning applications. And we're trying to do everything from chip development to release our internally developed neural network accelerator chip, circuit board designs that make it easy for engineers and product designers to take those chips, get them in their products, and get them to market software tools to help train models and design new models, and then off-the-shelf models so that you can get going for prototyping right away. So basically the soup to nuts of everything on-device machine learning is what we're trying to do at Team Coral. Okay, so before we jump into the details about that, I'm curious, why the name Coral? Where did you guys come up with that? Coral is awesome. These are small animals, a centimeter or smaller in size, and together, as a group, as a colony, they build these amazingly engineered structures that are visible from space. You know, the Great Barrier Reef is animal built and you can see it as you're orbiting the planet. So that kind of ecosystem where there's a whole bunch of smart engineers working together, building things as a group is what we're trying to foster at Coral. You've mentioned earlier that we really need on-device AI. And certainly a lot of early AI applications I've seen the AI work was done in the cloud, and IoT applications had to ship that data back and forth. Now, obviously, that's not the best solution, right? That's right. If your AI is in the cloud, the big advantage you have to have AI in the cloud is big, fat, neural network accelerators in data centers to crunch your AI. But there's a whole list of disadvantages. If you can do your AI local, your performance can be better because you're not you know, the latency of sending data up and getting data back. Embedded intelligence has access to all the data and all the sensors that your embedded device has. So it's all right there at the fingertips of the algorithms. You're saving power. Again, you're not transmitting. But also, if you have the right acceleration on your device, you can use less power to crunch the known networks. And we'll get to that power and on-device intelligence later in the talk. You could argue some of the best advantages, though, come from privacy and security. If your data is on your device and not being transmitted, you get inherently more privacy and more security right out of the box. 
These set of advantages really tilt the scales toward pushing intelligence onto the device, off the cloud, for users for the next generation applications. Certainly for the kind of edge devices that I've worked on, power is a huge driver. That really resonates. Okay, let's dive in and look under the hood at Coral. In the team Coral, we're working on basically four different groups of products to help engineers build smart devices. The core of it, the foundation, are the circuit boards uh, with our custom TPU acceleration chip on them. That coupled with sensors, so you can get information about the environment, which you need in order to do inference on. Software tools, uh, compiler, machine learning models, so that you can either build your own models or use your off-the-shelf models. And finally, reference projects, documentation, guides, examples to get you off and running quickly. Okay, cool. Now let's dive in and tell me about the hardware part here. Currently, we have six different products that we're offering. The foundation of our product and the flagship of our line is the Coral Dev Board. This is a single board computer with an NXP system on a chip running Linux. And sitting right next to that is our Google Edge TPU Neural Network Accelerator. You can plug the camera into this board for doing vision applications. And under that fan on the picture on the left is our SOM. This is the heart of our dev board. And on this is the NXP SOC and the TPU, memory, radio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all integrated on the module. So if you bring your application up on a dev board, you can then remove the SOM and plunk it down onto your product and get to market quickly. If you already have a PCIe slot in your product, then our PCIe accelerator will let you drop in our TPU into your existing offering and accelerate your inference without even having to redesign. Okay, so you've mentioned the TPU a couple of times. Now, I've heard a lot of rumblings about Google's TPU for a while. This mysterious ASIC that Google made for AI. Now, a version of that is in Coral, right? So tell me a little bit about the TPU itself. So first, TPU, what's in the name? So we started with CPUs, and then we moved on to math core processors, FPUs, if you recall, when those were separate chips. GPUs were all the rage when graphics were a thing. And now we need some way to accelerate TensorFlow processing, neural network processing. So the next evolution of this PU is the TPU. And this is a purpose-built ASIC, and it's designed to really streamline the computations and the silicon required to do machine learning inference. Basically, let's get rid of all the silicon that we don't need for general purpose computing. Let's make inference very fast. Let's make it easy to get data in and out of it, easy to get models in and out of it. And that is where we get our performance increases and where we get our power savings. So James, tell me a little bit about what kind of performance increases we'll see here compared to a conventional processor. Yeah, so the next slide shows our comparisons between desktop CPUs. And the first two columns show inference running on a desktop CPU. And the green one on the left shows the desktop CPU plus the USB edge accelerator. And if you look at the inference times there, they've gone down significantly, down to fractions of the original running time. So we're in the order of magnitudes there? Mm -hmm. What's even more impressive, though, when you compare that to an embedded TPU, which doesn't have the computation and the pipelines that a desktop has, but still, with the right design of your models and your algorithms, if you can push most of the inference onto the TPU, your inference times can get down awfully close to what you get with the desktop. So this is bringing essentially desktop performance to an embedded product. That has to be saving a lot of power, which is critical in my edge device, right? Uh, the PCIe accelerator, if you have an empty PCIe slot in your product, you can drop that in and with no design changes, add inference to an existing product. If you just want to prototype and get going, the Curl USB accelerator stick lets you plug right into any USB port. Now you can plug it into your computer or your single board computer, your, your Raspberry Pi type thing, anything that runs Linux, and run acceleration right there, right now, right today to get going with experimenting and playing with models. Now, with all that performance improvement, especially in the embedded space, let's talk about applications. What kind of applications are we really talking about here? So the whole point of getting computation to the edge is to get the computation out of the lab, out of the data centers. And here's an example from one of our customers where they took our dev board and put a out-of-the-box mobile net and went out to recognize cars and people and traffic lights. So it's not impressive that it's doing all this. What is impressive is that if you look at the frame rate at the bottom, it's claiming 48 frames per second down there, 20 millisecond inference times on these. That's really fast 
for a mobile embedded platform. This kind of high speed, high quality inference is what really lifts our products shine. So here's a testimonial from one of our customers where they took our dev board and dropped mobile net on it and just drove around and they could do inference at 20 milliseconds. That's over 30 frames a second for full frame video inference. This kind of price, performance, power, space really opens up all kinds of really awesome embedded applications for artificial intelligence. I can absolutely see that. I really wouldn't want any of my driving related things to have to send stuff up to the cloud to recognize them. But more to the point, it seems like with all this performance, I'm really going to be saving a lot of power in my system, which is absolutely critical. That's right. So the power that you put into this AI system, some of it goes to the CPU, some of it goes to the GPU, some of it goes to the TPU. And now we're into the space of clever system design, clever algorithm design to push your computation onto the processor that's best suited for it to minimize the power required to do that computation. So all these three things want to go together, right? Your GPU for your rendering and your graphics pipeline, your CPU for your general purpose computation and pre and post-processing of your data, and then your TPU to crunch your inference. Okay, I'm excited to get started with this. Now, we're all engineers here, so I want to know about the dev board. So the flagship of our product is the Coral dev board. And our goal here was to give you everything you needed to get up and running doing inference embedded on the edge inference right away. So it's a full computer, uses the NXP IMX8M system on the chip. It's got GPU and CPU on device memory, and then the TPU is right next to that on the SOM. Uh, the SOM is in the lower image, the red circuit board, showing the system on chip and the SOM on that small darter board. That darter board sits on top of that green baseboard, which basically we gave you all the I.O. we could think of and fit into that form factor. It's the same size and the same mechanical layout as a Raspberry Pi. So if you have been using that in your systems, you can unplug your Raspberry Pi and plug in our carrier board. We've included connectors for Ethernet, stereo, two microphones in the corners of the board to give you a little bit of stereo separation, USB-C, OTG, and power ports, uh, HDMI output, headphone jack. If you don't like our audio, you can use your own audio, micro SD card for storage, and camera and display ports on the bottom of the board. And that certainly looks like everything I would need in the projects I can think of right there on the board. Yeah, that was the idea, is to make it super easy for you to get to work right away. The heart of the dev board is the SOM. The SOM is the system on module, and it includes the NXP system on the chip, RAM, the TPU unit, power, control, and regulation, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. It's already certified. Um, you don't need to go through FCC again. It has a metal can over the top, which is not shown here, to keep all those radio waves in, and it's ready to deploy in your product. There's a 100-pin connector on the back, three of them to connect it right up to your board so you're ready to go right away. So that our intention was to get people up and moving on the dev board. And then for people who want to move to market quickly, take the SOM board, design the connectors into their product, and literally just drop it down to their product. That's cool. I can use the dev board as a reference to see how I could integrate it into my own circuit board when I'm ready to go to production. That seems like it would be a pretty easy transfer. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about some data sheet related stuff for this dev board. So the dev board, as I said before, has everything we can think of. I'm not going to sit here and read the whole list. You can read the data sheet at your leisure. Thank you. <laughs> but the, the key thing, uh, CPU and GPU built into the NXP SOC. The TPU is right there on the SOM. RAM, flash, Wi-Fi, power, USB to make it go and connect to the world. For the extended I.O., audio, video, SD, network. The GPU connector we have on the right-hand side is our best match to the Raspberry Pi GPIO. If you're using that and familiar with that, you'll find UART and SPI and I2C about where you expect to find them. All this is available with our custom Linux port. We call it Mendel. It gives you easy access to the I.O. and peripherals on the board. Cool. By the way, I think we have a whole Chalk Talk episode about that NXP SOC. So people may be familiar with that already. And you also said there was GPIO. Can you give me some more information about that? The GPIO port, we've worked hard to make it Raspberry Pi compatible. So you'll find the pins where you expect to find them. Uh, in particular, power, ground, TXD, SPI, I2C, 
all those things are available. PWM is obviously available. So if you have a board that you are prototyping on, um, it's easy to plug it into this baseboard or just break out your wires and connect them directly to the GPIO pins. So moving up a level, what do you think is the higher level use model for the dev board? What we intend for people to do is to put the dev board on their desk, plug in their monitor or the Ethernet port and log in, and ideally download one of our pre-canned models and before they get to lunch, have inference running on their desk. Take that, add the application code, tweak the model if they need to, to better detect the sorts of objects they want to find for their applications, and then have a very clear path to go from development and design to production and manufacturing, where they would then take the baseboard connector specs, build that into their existing systems, and then be able to deploy embedded AI into products right away. Cool. That looks like a really smooth workflow from initial design all the way into production. Yeah, that's our hope. And you said earlier that you had a USB stick version of this that lets me start developing right on my PC? So the Coral Accelerator board, we designed that to be able to plug into any computer that you'd want to use to test and develop. So it's got the Edge TPU right in this cute little plastic USB stick, Type-C connector. So it gets power and data from one connector. It's got USB, so you can plug it into your workstation or your laptop, or even plug it into your Raspberry Pi and all flow the inference from your main computers onto the TPU. So this is by far the easiest way to get going playing around with machine learning models. It's great for engineers and students alike to take the first steps into building new stuff and exploring new types of computation and machine learning. I can see handing these to the people doing the model development and things like that at the same time as our hardware people are using the dev board to start thinking about the board design and so forth. Is that kind of the idea here? That's absolutely correct. The software stack is identical. You can go buy a bunch of USB sticks for your software engineers, get them up and running right away. And your hardware engineers, at the, in the meantime, um, are working on a system of module to get that built into your custom baseboard. And the two can get together sometime in the future and expect that the software will still continue to work. Okay, I think I have a good grasp on the hardware part of this. Let's talk about software and the modeling side of things. So this is the key friction point for especially new users getting up and running with machine learning. And we've done everything we can to make this as easy as possible. In particular, from the tool point of view, the key thing we've done there is to provide a library of pre-compiled machine learning models. This all sits on top and adjacent to an SDK that lets you use the models, tweak the models with transfer learning, or train new models if you want to. So these pre-compiled models are the AI and analog to the reference design that I would typically get with a development board? Absolutely. It's a reference design, but there are a lot of them. And because it's software, you can load and mix and match models from the internet until you find the one that either works for your application or get close enough that you can then retrain the last few layers with transfer learning to tune to your application. This is all also supported with a robust set of documentation data sheets, SDK references, guides, and examples to really show the number and diversity of applications that you can do with embedded intelligence. Let's talk about my software people and what they're going to need to do to get the framework of this up and running. The Corolla API is broken up in a bunch of different layers. The very top, you need some kind of neural network model, and you can either compile your own model, download a model, We'll talk about the compilation and model development process later. From the user application point of view, we'll assume you start with a compiled TFLI model. With that model, you can either use our Python SDK or our C, C++ API to build your user application on top of. Um, They both give you access to the full set of features on the TPU. On our dev board, that API sits on top of our custom Mendel OS, which lets you integrate to the hardware easily and handles communication to the TensorFlow unit. And that runs on our dev board system. It's all designed to get you up and running quickly and get you access to the full power of the TPU should you want it, but still give you an easy path to start uh, at the very beginning. So how does the API talk to the TPU? What does that look like exactly? I know about APIs, but not in this context. So the TPU API, we wanted to wrap up all the details of the models and the parameters into an easy-to-use interface to make a single model object that you can call with the neural network model you want to run 
And then if you have multiple edge TPUs, you can specify which one you want to use to do the computation on. So for example, let's say you want to classify objects in an image. We saw that in a demo earlier, we were classifying cars and people and stop signs. So a classification engine, you would build a model that would do that. And that would take care of the details of finding the compiled TF flight model, loading it onto the edge TPU, and then getting the edge TPU ready now to accept data. So wrapping that kind of API into a program, here's what it would look like in Python. Now, the first two lines, make a detection engine, read in your labels so you know how to classify your outputs, open your input data, your image, draw it on the screen so you can see it. And then the real magic happens in the fifth line of code where you are running your engine, detecting in your image with your labels to tell you what it sees in the image. Answer is a list, you iterate through that, and if you've got a bounding box, you draw it on your image around the things that you detected, and you're done. So what is this? In nine lines of code, you've loaded your model, read your image, run inference, and now drawn the output visually on your screen. Cool, that's great, and far simpler than I had expected. You basically say, hey, TPU, here's my data. Go do your thing. And it does it? You know, this is the standard. My API is shorter than your API beauty contest of software. But we can play that beauty contest game. But there's real meat here where it's really flexible and very easy to then redeploy this and re-aim this at you know, the application as you start this example and then grow your application around it to let you uh, do the inference that you want to do for your application. Very cool. Now, you mentioned that there are already pre-built models to help me get started. There are lots of pre-built models and more growing every day. So we've seen object detection, image classification. There is uh, models for transfer learning, which lets you take an existing model and then change the last layers to detect your objects. We just released models for pose estimation and phrase detection. So these are all offline. Pose estimation lets you understand where a human is in your space and what pose that person is in. Uh, standing, sitting gives you basically a wireframe image of the person. And phrase detection is a set of, I think it's around 100 catchy phrases. Things like turn left, turn right, turn off, stop. The sorts of stuff you'd want to give to an embedded intelligent device in your environment to control it. So this slide here is showing some of the different types of image classification models. There's various different types of ImageNet and mobile net models. And there's a few that are tuned for insects and birds and plants. So you can take your device out into the world and understand the natural world around you. Cool. I can see how this could be a lot of fun before I even get started on my real design. Absolutely. One of the things we want to really foster is people going and having fun with this stuff. Machine learning is not just big, useful, practical, boring stuff, but it's also, you know, smart microscopes and smart toys and smart devices and things that can live in the world and understand the world around them better and help you understand the world around you better. Awesome. So is there a way we can see how this works? One of the demos that we have ready to go is a image detection on a treadmill. And the video is showing cars on our very fancy snazzy treadmill as the cars zip by you can watch the inference running in real time. And it's fast. You can watch the video and imagine how you keep up with real-time performance in its application. And this is all running on our embedded dev board. I'm also trying to figure out what happened to all of those cars after they fall off the end of that treadmill. But I guess that's a story for a different day. Well, you know, the world is either flat or round. It's hard to tell sometimes. Here seems to be the proof. <laughs> okay, so what else have you got? So this next demo is showing our seafood classification, where we have it trained up on different types of food. And you aim the camera at what you're eating, and it tells you what it is. You could imagine this could tap into a food database to tell you approximately how many calories you're eating, and maybe put little red circles over things you oughtn't be consuming. I'm not sure I want to see this, but yes. So this, this next slide here is showing the basic concept of transfer learning. And maybe you don't want to detect cars or birds. Maybe you have a different class of objects you want to train a model to detect. Maybe your thing is detecting, I don't know, Star Wars Lego minifigures. So you could take pictures of all your minifigures, go find all of them on the internet, and build up a large train database to really make a high fidelity model to train on Star Wars Lego minifigures. Or if you have a model that's close enough, maybe you can use transfer learning. And the way transfer learning works 
is this diagram is showing the blue nodes on the left-hand side are the camera inputs. The blue nodes on the right-hand side are the model outputs. And the orange nodes are all the intermediate layers that are doing the inference and computation to push the image from step to step to step as the computer tries to figure out what the minifigure is. The green layer, the second to last layer, is the one that's important for trans learning. That's the one that we're going to modify in order to learn new classes that are relevant to your application. So the advantage here is that we don't have to retrain the entire network. We can do it with far less data and far less time than retrain the whole network. The disadvantage is that depending on the model you start with, you don't have the flexibility to learn entirely new models. So your accuracy may not be as good. But for some applications, this can work really, really well. And you can do it very efficiently. Okay, so what would it look like if I wanted to code that up? Here are the set of commands that you would need to run from your terminal to prepare your data set and then retrain for just the last few layers of the model on your new data. And then you get to watch the logs view by and your model pops out at the end of this. So give me an idea about what it would look like to actually see it running. One of the best examples of the transfer learning is a teachable machine demo that is on our website that lets you take the mobile net model, which is classified as a thousand objects. It removes the classifications from that model. The intermediate layer is 1,024 different outputs. And we don't really know what these outputs are, but we can then present it with new data, in this case, a hamburger, and the user is pushing the green button to tell the computer that, let's classify anything that looks like this hamburger as green. And then there's some various ice cream scoops. I think there's some pistachio and maybe that's an eclair right there. So you can hold up different items in front of the camera and tell the network to train and classify these items uh, into different bins. And then when you present it with the hamburger again, the computer will then light up the green light, indicating that it can recognize this object in the class that you've trained literally just seconds before by pushing a button. So it does not get any easier than this to train machine learning. And I, I've given this demo to middle school students and engineers alike, and everyone can figure out how to get it done. So it works well. Very cool. There seems to be this whole continuum between a pre-trained model out of the box all the way to having to build something from scratch. That's right. So we want to meet users where they are on their level of technical sophistication. And we've got three different use cases for how you can get at getting a model to our board. The first and easiest case is use a pre-compiled model. These are pre-trained machine learning models. You download them from our website. There are more there. They're growing every day. The second case is transfer learning. So start with a model that is already trained, but close. Add your own data. Train the last layers. You can do that either from the command line or you know, a project like Teachable Machine lets you do it dynamically at runtime. And then that model can run on your dev board and do your inference. Third case is roll your own model. If you have your own data and you have your own compilers and you have your own workstations to compile on, you can now start with your data, use our cloud compiler, and end up with a quantized model that you then run through our edge TPU, and then that can go right on your dev board. Okay, and that one is the one that gives me the most heartburn, obviously. Can you break that down for me? So the steps to actually build your own model are somewhat complicated, but they're pretty straightforward with the exception of one. So assuming you're starting with a TensorFlow model that you like, your TensorFlow model is using 32-bit floating point numbers. The first step is to quantize this to use 8-bit integer numbers. The Google Edge TPU doesn't have floating points. It was one of the compromises to keep the power and the size down. But you can do really accurate and high-performance inference with integer numbers, but you have to train your model in a quantized, aware training. So you have to know, for example, as your data comes out, to reduce the precision at each step or at key points so that the errors that creep in from quantization can then be learned and relearned as part of the model. Once you've done that step, that step is the high friction point right now. There's equal parts science and craft in understanding how to tweak your model and where to put your quantization steps to preserve your accuracy, but then get down to your 8-bit integers. Once you've got that exported, the rest of the process is pretty straightforward. You take your frozen graph from your TF model, convert that to TF Lite, compile that to the Edge TPU model. So now the operations and the instructions are now reduced to machine code for the TPU. And at that point in time, just deploy that onto your hardware. This is as easy as we can make it and still respecting the computation differences between the Edge TPU and you know, a standard floating point neural network. 
I can definitely see how that quantization step is going to be key. And I assume there are tools that will help me understand it as we go through that flow and how it's going to affect the accuracy or performance of my model. Absolutely. That is the standard quantization technique where you have your full model running on your golden test data and you compare it to the quantized model. And this is where the craft comes in to know where to tweak your quantization to preserve as much of that accuracy as possible. The testing that we've done shows that for most applications that we, that we want to run, we can get very high accuracy comparable to the full flowing point model on quantized networks. Got it. It may take a little practice, but it looks like a really straightforward process. We've got a bunch of pre-compiled models on our website already. You've seen image classification. So this slide is showing the many different versions of image classification. Some of my personal favorites are the models that we built for classifying the natural world. We've got the standard ImageNet model, which recognizes fun things like pandas, cars, and pizza. We drill down and make models for the natural world that focus on plants, insects, and birds. So this is one of the great things you can do with embedded intelligence is because you can take your model with you and run it on device, you can get it out into the natural world. So at some level, we're encouraging engineers to go outside. That looks great. And it also looks like Google isn't planning on building all of these models themselves, right? There's an ecosystem of a lot of people contributing to the model universe. Absolutely. Our goal is to open source as much as we can and build as much community as we can and to get as many different people working on building models together as a community. Great. And you've got a demo to show me? And it seems like there are countless applications where I could deploy this technology. So where are the biggest places you could see this go? What we're seeing in the future is that we can get the price point down, get the power down, and preserve privacy and security. There are many, many places where we can put AI in the future where it's not practical to deploy now. And this slide is just showing basically everything. It looks like the real version of this slide could be much, much larger. We certainly have no shortage of potential applications right now. There's so many places you can put on-device AI out in the world. This slide is showing just a small tip of the iceberg. Of particular interest to me are places where, because of the privacy and security that you can get with embedded AI, you can talk about things like healthcare and education and even toys, where you have very sensitive privacy issues with children and patients and records where the data is on device. It never leaves the device. So you, you get your security. Imagine something even simple as a motion sensor for a room. Right now, if you stand still in a room long enough, anyone who's worked late at work knows, the lights will go off and the heat goes off and you're sitting in the cold, in the dark at your computer late at night. It's really bad. Wouldn't it be great if your office building could love you a little bit more and know that even though you're not moving, there's still a person over there and that person should be warm and loved too. Keep the lights on, keep the heat on, and still preserve your privacy because it doesn't even know who you are. It's not reporting, it's not recording any images. All it's doing is sending a signal to the thermostat to keep the temperature up. Thank you, James, for joining me today and talking all about Google Coral. Pleasure to be here. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about Google's Coral TPU. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.